Welcome to our video module on statics. We've been covering the second moment or the moment of inertia for uh, a couple of sessions now and I'd like to take a little bit of a jump into uh, when I first heard this idea of a second moment or a moment of inertia I'd like to take a jump into what I immediately thought of. Now probably some of you have taken physics and when you're looking at physics a lot of times you deal with spinning masses and when you deal with those spinning masses one of the things that comes up is its inertia I. Now we have a general feel for that and the general feel is let's imagine we're spinning about the y-axis here and it's gonna have lots of inertia if you it's gonna take a lot of work to get it going and once you get it going it's gonna wanna keep on spinning and it's gonna do so with pretty sizable force however However, let's take a look at what happens if you try and spin it, say, about the x-axis. You try spinning it about the x-axis and you're going to be able to get it going right away. It's going to spin quickly. It's not going to have that much inertia. It's going to be easy to get going and conversely, it's going to be easy for it to stop. It'll slow down pretty quickly. Now we have a basic feel for this and that feel should feel very similar to what we've covered thus far with our moments of inertia in bending. The further we get from the axis, when we looked at our bending, like right here, the further we got from the axis, the more it fought the bending. And if we had an object that was really big and really massive, it wants to fight that bending more. If it was really close to the axis, if the, if the object, say, it had a different shape, say like this, if it was really close to the axis, it wouldn't fight the, the shape wouldn't fight bending as much. Well, this should, the reason why this feels so similar is because they're basically the same. This inertia right here, when something is spinning, is called the mass moment of inertia. I'm going to write down these equations from what we've learned thus far. This is what we've learned thus far, the moment of inertia. This is when we're bending something or twisting. Let's take a look at what happens if we're spinning something or rotating a three-dimensional mass. Let's look at our first case where we want to know what the moment, mass moment of inertia is about the y-axis. Integral of x squared plus z squared dm. And in this case, you can imagine that this is that th there's influences here. The inter the x squared. The further away you get from the y-axis, here let's let's change color here. The further away you get from the y-axis, the more inertia you're going to have. The more mass moment of inertia you're going to get. In the same way, the further you get a away in the z-axis, the higher your uh, inertia is going to be. Now in, the, in our case the z-axis, this thing's really thin. So you're going to hardly have any z influence. But it's easy to imagine a, a situation where that's not the case. All right? So the mass moment inertia, iy, is square root of x squared plus z squared. Let's try, I just want to, just, just for good measure, I'm going to write down what it is here. If we were to rotate it about the x value, we get y squared plus z squared dm. Polar moment of inertia. Now if you recall when we took a look at the polar moment of inertia, here, let, let's, let's keep that in, in gray to keep our, our colors straight. Our polar moment of inertia, this is if we had an object and we tried to twist it. We're going to try twisting this way, twisting this way. How much is it going to resist that rotation? With the polar moment of mass moment of inertia, we're going to take that same cylinder, right? We're going to take this cylinder and instead of trying to twist it, we're going to spin it. How strongly does it resist spinning? What's going on? In this case, we're going to take the integral of r squared dm and apply it to this shape. You can imagine, just like before, the, if we have a really big radius, a really wide object, it's going to want to resist that rotation more. Because these equations are so similar, we also have a parallel axis theorem, which looks frighteningly similar to the other one. 
instead of area. We're not as concerned about area, we're concerned about mass now. So i is i bar plus md squared, and we have our radius of gyration. Also, these two really go hand in hand, parallel axis and radius of gyration. It's going to be k squared times m. In summary, let's scroll down and see and make sure that we understand exactly what the differences are here and when we use them. The mass moment of inertia, we use this anytime we have a rotating mass. Anytime we want to spin something, we have a rotating mass. We use our moment of inertia or our second moment, we use these equations anytime we have bending, if we're trying to bend something, or if we're looking at torsion. Likewise, we also see it when we're dealing with hydrostatics. Anytime we're underwater. So you can imagine we could have a lot of fun with a rotating mass underwater. That could add to all that that could add all sorts of variables. Um, finally, a good way to uh, think of it is these are internal forces. These are internal forces that are being transferred along the uh, transferred along the object. The rotating mass tells you about um, as opposed to what's happening with the mass moment of inertia where we're really trying to rotate something. I hope that gives a clear distinction between the moment of inertia and the mass moment of inertia, how we use them, what the equations are, and um, have fun using them.